I see this guy jump out and I see three muzzle flashes and my mind's like, oh, we're taking fire. And I instinctively reach for my comms to identify the threat. The second round went through the belly of the helicopter and through the fiberglass floor and then bounced up and went under my helmet through the scalp, not breaking the skull. And it just rode my skull all the way around to the, the side. Welcome to Combat Story. I'm Ryan Fugit, and I serve Warzone Tours as an Army Attack helicopter pilot and CIA officer over a 15-year career. I'm fascinated by the experiences of the elite in combat. On this show, I interview some of the best to understand what combat felt like on their front lines. This is Combat Story. Today, we hear the combat story of Jimmy Settle, a retired Air Force pararescue man, or PJ, credited with saving 38 lives and assisting in saving 28 others in combat, in addition to saves in the Alaskan wilderness. He racked up over 270 CSAR hours in Afghanistan, where he earned an Air Medal with Valor for his life-saving heroics and a Purple Heart after being shot in the head and returning to combat 24 hours later. His book, Never Quit, chronicles the friendships, hardships, pranks, and events that changed his life on the front lines of the PJ world. I hope you enjoy his story as much as I did. Enjoy. All right, uh, Jimmy, thank you for for uh, sharing your story with us today. Thanks, Ryan. I really appreciate you making the time to interview me and hear my story. Perfect. So, Jimmy, your your book, Never Quit, that I, I just finished, honestly reads a lot to me like in a positive way, almost like Forrest Gump, where things happen to you that yeah. should only happen to 10 or 15 other people separately and all happen to you in one lifetime in a short period of time. So there's a lot to unpack. Before we get into that, I was hoping just the kickoff question, sure. what is the coldest you have ever been? Because as I look at your life growing up in Alaska, you go through this massive PJ pipeline, you're doing pararescue in Alaska, you're in Afghanistan up in the mountains. What is the coldest you have ever been? Training, combat, whatever. Cold has been a long, intimate partner of mine throughout my life many times. Um, <clears throat> throughout high school, I was part of a cross-country ski team, uh, racing team. And, so, you know, you'd zipping around in the woods and spandex, not much else. <laughs> <laughs> and so it was like almost an annual event where I would get frostbite on my pecker and on my hands and my ears and cheeks. And so it was like, that would be the indicator to me, like, oh, you need to wear that uh, underwear with duct tape on the front to kind of block the wind there. <laughs> so that was like my introduction to being cold. And I would have some really fierce days. You come in from the cold and that throbbing, because like, like some of my most painful memories of cold are coming in after races and that, that throbbing feeling as the blood's rushing back to those sensitive areas. But uh <clears throat> None of that really prepared or compared to uh, uh, being dunked in the, the Cook Inlet in February uh, in the middle of the night. I mean, there was a lot of times in the pipeline where we were really, really cold, cold for like days on end and just like, oh, it's sapping your body. But when I was in the water with Roger, that was next level cold. It was unbelievably cold. And like, com I can compare that to excuse me, doing uh, winter helicopter work in Fairbanks in the, in the wintertime where it's already like negative 20 degrees and then you're under the rotor disc and you've got all this blasting. And it's so cool too because sometimes in the wintertime when it's really that cold, the helicopters generate an amazing amount of static electricity. So you grab that hoist cable and it's zippity, zappity, zippity, zappity. It's shocking <laughs> you. You could just feel it pulsing through your body. Uh, but no, getting dunked in that water for like 45 minutes with a semi leaky dry suit was it took like a week to recover from and and actually to this day my hands don't work right anymore they are as soon as i touch cold they get white and they're creaky and achy so i think my experience in cook inlet was absolutely the most coldest i've ever been okay i mean that and on a good day that water in february is like 30 degrees and there's chunks of ice bouncing off of roger and i it was so cold, in fact, that there was ice forming on the inside and the outside of our dive masks. So we really couldn't even see. And I didn't think that would be possible. It was nuts. <laughs> so I, I, I want to get back to that instance because I feel like that's one of 
I, I don't know how many near death experiences you've had, but I feel like that's <laughs> one of them. And we got to talk about it later. So now let me let's let's take a moment to just describe what a PJ is, because I had this vision in mind from being in the military and I was in the, on the army side of it. Um, to me, a PJ was this idea of a lone ranger in a flight suit, geared up, all tactical, that very rarely gets called on and has to go in and like recover a pilot deep behind enemy lines. That was always kind of like my impression. After reading your book and looking at the pipeline you go through, it's almost like you're a, um, a medevac crew on steroids with enormous capability. So how would you describe a PJ to the layman in the military who's never come across them? Well, I think you've got a really good handle on it. Um, <clears throat> uh, there's a bunch of different ways you can look at it. And what's, what's kind of neat. So yeah, pararescue in itself was initially established as a insurance policy for the military to recover their highly trained uh, pilots behind enemy lines and recover or destroy sensitive equipment. And mm -hmm. uh, in addition to that, because of these skill sets, we are also tasked with responding to uh, na uh, tragic, uh, oh man, my brain just dumped on me, uh, natural disasters, things like humanitarian missions. Uh, mm -hmm. And then that evolved uh, into search and rescue and stuff. However, within the community, uh, which many folks don't know about, is uh, pararescue kind of gets divided into two groups. Uh, there's the rescue side of the house, and then there's the special tactics side of the house. And I was part of the rescue side, the RQS squadron. And then the STS squadrons, uh, they have a slightly different mission set. Uh, the rescue squadron, the res rescue side of the house was my, it was, was my passion. That's the way I wanted to go. And because I grew up in Alaska, and in Alaska, the, the, the PJs up there do a ton of civilian search and rescue work. And uh, I guess I'm jumping ahead, but, you know, uh, back in the uh, 70s, my family had a horrific boating accident, and it turned out to be Air Force PJs that came and saved them. Didn't know this until I was writing the book, so that's pretty cool. I'm sorry, I think I kind of walked away from what a PJ is, but uh, no. so PJs, uh, they're kind of like, you, you nailed it in that they are the last line of 911 kind of. Uh, they, we're the dudes that'll go in when nobody else can or won't go in. And uh, you're right in terms of like, sometimes they're, we're just a dude and a piece of glass, behind a piece of glass that says break in case of emergency, all kitted up, you know, with parachutes, scuba tanks, weapons, all that good stuff. Plus all the tons and tons of rescue and recovery gear, like for collapsed spaces and all sorts of neat stuff. Um, <clears throat> so anyways, the rescue side of the house, their mission mainly involves like sit and alert and for launching on rescue missions, which could be a pilot going down or hikers getting lost or troops in an ambush. The other side of the house, the special tactics squadron guys, they're the dudes that tag along with like the Navy SEAL teams when they're doing kinetic, kinetic strikes and stuff like that. And so there's really two roles. You can either be attached to like a helicopter platform or a C-130 or C-17 or something like that. And, or you can be attached to a special operations team that's on the ground, whether it's uh, alphabet soup or whatever. Uh, it's just like we're door kicking medics, but we're not going to be the first one through the door. We shouldn't be. You don't want us to be the first one through. So in that case, the, the STS side, they are performing like an enhanced medic role on those yeah, teams. Like Exactly, like an 18 Delta. Got it. All right, yeah. With that, a, that translates well to, to my side of the house for sure. Yeah. And, uh, and we're, that's kind of what the pipeline is uh, designed to do, is to make us be able to be plug and play within the DOD's other special operations communities. Like if they've got, a, they're spinning up a mission somewhere, they can just pull the PJ from whatever squadron and stick it in, and it should just be minimum you know, time to get spun up and on the same page. Yeah. All right. Got it. And just looking at the, on the Air Force's site about like the, what it takes to get into, into that career, how long it takes, like, and we'll get to the pipeline because I think you can't talk about that discipline without this awesome courses that you get to take that very yeah. few people get to do one of and you get to do all of them. So we'll get to that. You got to tell me about 
growing up, Alaska. I think talking about that accident you just <laughs> described is important, but what what got you into the Air Force? Like, what was your family environment like? Um, did you have military background in the family? How did you find your way there? Um, I think like if uh, you read the book or just if you hang around me, I'm pretty non-traditional, non-direct. I kind of come at things from funny angles. And so, uh, yeah, there was some, there is a lot of military history in my family. Uh, my father was in the Navy. He was a cook, not that glamorous, but people need to eat. Um, <laughs> And my grandfather, he, his job was pretty cool. He did Korea and Vietnam War, and he was one of the first uh, Air Force forward air controller types. And uh, he would spend 30, 40 days behind enemy lines just on foot patrols calling in stuff. And he had some crazy oh. stories. <clears throat> and then uh, what the crazy thing about my grandpa is that uh, his name is Jim Lovell, and uh, the same as the astronaut. And that did the Apollo 13. That's awesome. And, uh, yeah. And when he was deployed downrange, he was off the grid. And so he was from a small town in Oregon. And a lot of the folks from Oregon thought he was the astronaut <laughs> instead of a, a combatant in Korea and Vietnam. <laughs> so when he came back, he had to really kind of sort that out. <laughs> <laughs> did, did you talk to him about his experiences in combat before you joined the Air Force or was it after? It was after, it was after, uh, he was, he's one of those veterans that was really guarded about his stories. And, uh, you know, he had some pretty intense experiences. And when they came back the the environment was much different, you know, civilians and stuff weren't quite as welcoming as they are today. And so yeah. he, he kind of did like the, the PTSD nosedive where he just became a commercial fisherman out of Kodiak where he could just be the master of his own destiny away from everybody. And eventually came out of that and became a great grandpa. But uh, uh, yeah, he kind of kept it quiet until after I came back from combat. And then we, he started opening up and we started sharing stories. And that was, that was real special. That was really cool. Because I could tell it was stuff he hadn't talked about in years. And you could start yeah. seeing it come out. And, and it was really nice to be able to bond on that level with him. Yeah. Oh, that's really, that's special right there. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> So in the book, talks about your kind of foray into um, cross country, and you mentioned it earlier. And I feel like it's not even, it's not like you just did cross country, you kind of excelled at it and, and it propelled you forward. So did that feed into you joining the military at some point, this like athletic desire or um, push for being better? I think my cross country experience actually uh, fed that monkey real well, but it also gave me a lot of tools that enabled me to be successful uh, in the pipeline and in as a PJ. Um, <clears throat> there's, you know, the structure, because I, you're right, I didn't just run cross country, I lived it. You know, I, uh, it taught me how to be disciplined and be mindful of my body and listening to my body and like sometimes saying no to going out with friends because I've got something that's more important to me. And I think those kinds of things are really helpful in the pipeline because uh, we'll get into it later, but the pipeline's a really long experience and uh, you can get tired of being locked down all the time and just saying no to fun. But, you know, if you say <laughs> yes to fun too many times, you're going to have some hard times. Yeah. Uh, but cross country is also how I learned about that, that this ties into the pararescue in that one of the friends I made in cross country running after high school, he became a PJ up in Alaska and he was the one that kind of more formally introduced me to the career field and what, the, what it was like on the inside. And that guy's name's Chris Robertson, and he's still PJing it up up in Alaska. He's one of the senior leadership on the enlisted side up there. And he is a great dude. He'd be a fun guy for you to talk to if you ever get yeah. a chance. Is, is he the one that first talked to you about being a PJ? I think if I recall in the book, you're, you're working at a shoe store maybe, and somebody comes in and they're like, hey, have you heard about this? hundred percent. Yeah. I was working at this. Uh, so that was cross country running led me to this job at a really high end uh, specialized running store in Alaska, a place called Skinny Raven, which uh, it wasn't like your normal shoe store in that it was designed. It was a shop where we would fit people to their specific needs for running. And uh, so we, uh, 
the PJ team would come into our store to get fitted for shoes because the unit would buy them shoes. And then one day I recognized the guy. I was like, hey, I know you. And he's like, Jimmy. And so he brought in, Chris brought in his laptop and just showed me like an hour of just slideshow of all these cool things, these cool jumps, these cool dives, these cool rescue missions. And he, he really planted that seed and got me thinking and training about it. And yeah. I, talked to a, I talked to a few other friends about what pararescue was. One guy was a ranger who uh, transitioned to LERP or something like that. And uh, I told him, hey, man, I'm thinking about being a PJ. He's like, dude, that's really hard. You should probably just do a LERP or something like that. It's like, oh, I really want to do this other stuff. <laughs> and then uh, there was this old man who uh, was a, a friend of one of my running coaches growing up who was a former SEAL through Vietnam era. And I talked to him a little bit about it. And he's like, oh, those PJs are the best. I love PJs. So like when you, when you start talking to these other operators and these crusty, salty dudes, and they're like, dude, PJs are the bomb. It's like, well, what is this group of dudes I've never heard about that everybody who does know about them loves them. So yeah. it really got me motivated. And, and then, so, and I, I think I may have jumped forward there because if I recall, you went to the Naval Academy for a period and, Correct, then, yeah. and then came back and this, I think, happened, right? Yep. Yeah, so, in that, yeah, so out, right out of high school, I was a really fast cross-country runner. And so I had some colleges offering scholarships. Uh, but the Naval Academy was really tempting. Uh, <laughs> this is kind of funny because uh, back when I was a little kid, Top Gun came out. And that was one of the, the first movies I saw in a movie theater. And that got the conversation started at home, like, what's the Navy? What do they do? And my mom was very pro-Navy, like, oh, yeah, you can do anything you want. And so when I was offered an opportunity to go to the Naval Academy, I scooped it up. And, uh, you know, the circumstances didn't work out. Uh, you know, I had, some, I had a cardiac event that uh, really changed the direction I was going. And uh, I was, it's, a multiple, it's a blessing because, excuse me. If I had taken a scholarship to, say, a university and then had this cardiac event, which is just kind of laying in wait, uh, I would have been hosed. You know, they probably would have pulled my scholarship and I would have been sent kicking rocks. Uh, but since I was at the academy, they, they patched me up. You know, they did surgery and they, they made sure I was good and healthy. And then I had some long thoughts and I realized that the Navy wasn't going to I wasn't going to be able to do what I wanted to do in the Navy, which was either become a pilot or become a SEAL or any of these kind of cool, those sexy jobs, you know, and I was afraid my heart would limit me. And so I just kind of parted ways. It was cool because they didn't really have any misgivings. They were like, yeah, go, go, go have a good life. And uh, so then after that, I went and got the job. I got, I went back to work at Skinny Raven and, but the, things I picked up in the Naval Academy stuck to me, like how to dress, how to say hi, like these weird manners, you know, like uh, fork and knife kind of kind of skills that you don't really pick up in life unless you've got a real disciplined family or something. Yeah. But uh, <laughs> learn, you know, and that, that stuff, it really kind of never went away. And so in that, I, I left the Naval Academy in 97. And then I did the shoe thing for so just a little after 9-11, when 9-11 kicked off, that's when my friend Chris started coming around more often. And I wanted to be a part of this thing. You know, there was a high, uh, high patriotism was really, it was a big deal. And I wanted to do something. And what I found cool about PJs is that, yeah, you're door kickers, you're special operations dudes. But the thing that's driving the mission is rescue. You're saving lives. That's the goal. And I don't know, I've always kind of visualized myself as somebody who's friendly and helpful and wanting to help people. And I saw this as like the most extreme way I could take this, uh, that desire. And so, yeah. yeah, it's, it's not a direct path, but it all kind of like little pieces <laughs> no. is building on themselves. And, uh, yeah. And I trained for like a year in secret because, uh, I wasn't sure if I could be a PJ because the, the, the test to get in was really hard it was harder than there's initial uh exam your physical aptitude stamina test that is a ball buster and at the time it was the hardest workout i'd ever done in my life 
it was just passing that initial eval. And then Chris told me, yeah, dude, you got to be ready to do that every day. That's what we do. <laughs> I, I got to say, like, I mean, you, you almost gloss over, you describe this as a cardiac event that you had, but I, I feel like, I mean, if from looking at the book, that is probably your first near death experience. I think like, yeah. It, and the way yeah. you describe it, you can feel the pressure on your chest and like how bad that felt and how invasive that was, right? Like that surgery. And yes. I mean, it, it, it wasn't like you were in and out in a couple of days and you were just back to normal. I mean, it was a significant physical event for you from, from reading the book. Yeah. And it was uh, physically, emotionally, and all of that. Like, so for uh, the listeners, I guess I'll go a little more deeply into it. How yeah. it happened was, uh, you know, I was like 19, uh, maybe 150 pounds, but I could run like uh, four and a half minute miles endlessly. You know, just just go. I was just a little. All I was was lungs and legs. You're, I mean, you're yeah. a collegiate athlete. Yeah, like <laughs> that caliber, right? So I think that sets the stage for this. It's not like you just started working out one day and then this happened because your body wasn't ready for it. Right, yeah. And, uh, and you know, also that's when you're that invested into something to be performing at that level, it becomes part of your identity. You know, it's part of every, everything you do is uh, you're thinking about how it's going to affect your performance later on, whether it's sleep, food, drink, all that good stuff. Mm -hmm. And, uh, so I was, uh, so <clears throat> it started after the, well, towards the end of the cross country running season and early into the indoor track season, I started having these weird, like chest feelings when I'd get running and I just felt like I had no gas in the tank. Like I would try to push the gas pedal and the engine would just flood kind of thing. And then it got worse and worse. And eventually, uh, I threw on a, um, a heart rate monitor and was doing a workout and I could have swore the heart rate, this is back when polar heart rate monitors were like the cat's meow. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> yep. and uh, it was reading like this crazy number way over 200 and flashing. I was like, oh, this fucking thing's broken. All right, whatever. I'm going to keep going. But I told my coach, he's like, no. <laughs> he's like we, should, we should get this looked at. But, you know, let's go do this uh, meet. And I was really excited because I was running an indoor track meet at Harvard, which is a really cool indoor track. It's wooden, it's old, and it's in this small building. So when you're running, it's like boom, 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 boom. You can just hear the steps. And when the pack's coming through, it sounds like a herd of horses. It's like a magical place to run. And you know, as we touched on, I was a pretty fast fella. At this race, it was only a mile run, uh, but it's eight laps on this little tiny track. I was getting lapped and that had never happened before. And I was pushing the gas harder and harder and it was just struggling. Couldn't catch my breath in my heart. My chest was just going crazy. I could look down at my shirt and just see my shirt just fluttering like crazy. And about that same time I was getting like, my legs were going numb. My arms were getting heavy. I was, there was no breath getting in. And then the world is my first time with the world starting to kind of fade into a black tunnel. My first time, yeah. <laughs> right. And, uh, yeah, I collapsed off the side of the track, and it turned out, you know, I had this, uh, what, what we found out eventually was that my heart had developed a third electrical node. So within the anatomy of the heart, there's two primary electrical nodes that drive the pumping action of the heart. That's why we get that lub-dub, lub-dub. My heart decided it was so cool it wanted a third one of those. It, <laughs> But like me, if you see me, I don't dance with rhythm. I got no rhythm. I started in my heart. <laughs> uh. When I got that third node, my heart could not keep a rhythm. And so when I pushed the gas, it would just go into this uh, fibrillation event. And so, uh, yeah, so they went in through my, so cutting forward a little bit, you know, I'm still this 19 year old college athlete, but I've been kind of locked up on the campus, not really out seeing girls or anything like that. And uh, they fly me to a hospital, the National Navy Medical Center there in Bethesda, where at the time was one of the best hospitals in the world. Um, <clears throat> and they performed a surgery on me. And the surgery was, they used a laser and they put scar tissue around that third electrical node using this laser. 
But to get there, they had to go through my femoral artery, which was bizarre. And uh, yeah, like the first attractive girl I've seen in like six months or whatever, she's the nurse tech that's got to shave the hair in my femoral artery. And I'm 19. <laughs> I'm five ways awkward. Just like, I don't know what the hell's going on here. And uh, <laughs> uh-huh. <laughs> but uh yeah, there, that that whole experience was wacky. I mean, I have like these. So the surgery, they went in and they uh, they they didn't knock me out. They kept me lucid, but I was heavily sedated, uh, and uh, so I can hear and feel things. And uh, to do the laser part, they actually had to stop my heart. And uh, that now I know what a heart attack really feels like because it was the most bizarre thing. It felt like an elephant punched me in the chest. Like it's no joke. And then like everything also in my mind, I remember just like my hearing was quiet. Like I didn't hear, like my hearing was a little bit better. And then I realized, oh, it's because I'm not hearing that background sound of blood flow and stuff through my hearing. Like, oh, the heart stopped. You know, and all this, I'm in this weird <laughs> lucid state. Like, oh. Yep. <laughs> uh, but it all goes really well. It was a, a very weird experience. And, uh, you know, I'm recovering in the hospital. And uh, I find out later on. So at the time, I thought things were weird because my mom flew down and my grandma flew down to come hang out with me. And I just thought it was weird because they weren't really hanging out with me. I found out later on they both had pneumonia and they couldn't be near me. <laughs> so <laughs> it was just like, what the fuck? What the hell's going on here? <laughs> and so... Uh, and then in the hospital, I remember uh, when they transferred me from, this, from the litter to the bed, uh, one of the bandages came off of my femoral artery, and I'm in this doped up state. And I just thinking, I've never taken hallucinogens at that time. And I just remember thinking, cool, the walls are changing colors, they're turning red. And there's people no. just panicking around me. And no just, way. Yeah, so what happened is my femoral artery was just spraying blood everywhere. Oh and, yeah, and like this big, huge, muscly guy came in, pushed my my mom and my grandma aside, and just putting direct pressure on me. I'm like, "Ow, that hurts! Stop it!" Trying to push his hands off me. He's like, "No, bro!" And at the same time, I'm embarrassed because I feel like I peed myself. Yeah, because it's all warm and wet, and like I'm embarrassed. Like you don't want to touch my pee, but <laughs> <laughs> such a crazy experience for a 19 year old, right? Or anybody at that yeah matter. Dude, so. So when you, I, I know you, you kind of describe having to, to leave the Naval Academy, your mom isn't happy about it. And no. I mean, it's seen, I, I would imagine being 19, like you're in this great spot. You had the scholarship, you're at one of the best schools in the country. Um, I, I imagine you could have stayed there. No problem with the scholarship. Um, mm-hmm. And you, you decide to walk away against your family's kind of desires. Reading more in the book doesn't surprise me that you kind of choose your own path, but like how, how did you think about that at the time? Because you still could have gone in the Navy, right? And For sure. Made- yep. Yeah, they didn't kick me out. Yeah, I left. Yeah, I want to be clear about that. And uh, and that was a 19-year-old decision, you know, because uh, around this time, you know, I'm thinking about, oh, how the, the goals I had now have to be changed. Because also, I wasn't running anymore either. Running was, yeah. at the time, I was running two or three workouts a day, and now I'm down to zero. And if you do that to anybody, it's going to make them start going a little crazy. And then I'm also, this is at the beginning of email in college. And so I'm getting emails from my friends like, oh, dude, the party last weekend was awesome. I'm having so much fun. <laughs> college is so cool. And I'm like, this college sucks. They won't let us do anything. <laughs> These guys are mean. <laughs> and so I chose, I mean, I, I didn't even really talk to my parents about it until right before you know i'd already at this point committed i would talk to the uh the the commander of my uh what do they call it i want to say squadron because i'm air force now they remapped my brain but yeah the uh the commander who was a uh, a major in the marine corps and i talked to him about it and he's like dude you got to stick around i was like i don't want to and he's like all right wow. I told my parents my mom was pissed and she was like you're not coming home i don't care what you do but you can't come home and I understand it now. I'm like, yeah, <laughs> you jackass. But that was good because it took me on a different path that led me to something else really yeah. cool. Yeah. And I got to have my own adventures in a weird, different, indirect, twisted way. 
Yeah. I mean, even you just saying like, you know, it's hard here. People are mean to me. And then, <laughs> and then you look at what you ended up going through ha- right. had to have been exponentially worse than what you would have gone through at the Academy. I'm assuming. <laughs> so. Oh, the irony of my choices was not yes. lost on me later on. <laughs> awesome all right let's let's jump then you're at you're at the shoe store chris comes in he talks to you shows you kind of some of the the stuff that they're doing the high speed stuff you decide to get into the pipeline talk to me about the pipeline and just like from what i've written down you have in dock combat diver airborne free fall you go to sear like five times pararescue emt you got your apprentice course i'm sure i missed some but this is a long evolution in, in, in the training pipeline just before you can get your beret and even start start working. Coming from the, the aviation community, I can appreciate the long pipeline. Like flight school is very long. You're constantly evaluated every day, every week there's a test. Everything you do is tracked very closely. Um, you do SEER, you do the outdoor stuff, you do the book stuff, and you kind of talk about the mental versus physical. Like, talk to me about the pipeline, man. What is that like? How daunting did it feel? How rewarding at the end? Oh, man. It was an awesome adventure. Uh, some of the old PJs that uh, – so I was a guard guy. Uh, I when uh, After 9-11 kicked off and I decided I wanted to be a PJ, I joined the Alaska Air National Guard. And so that – pipeline track is slightly different than uh, the active duty side and what in terms of like who owns you and I that was something I learned about when I was in it it's like if I went active duty then the regular cadre they're in charge of you they're in charge of your uh, mapping out your pipeline but if you're in the guard the state owns you and then you kind of like the redheaded stepchild getting picked last for dodgeball kind of thing a lot of times <laughs> <laughs> and so but also on the other side of that token, the Alaska team is a really prestigious team. It's very busy. They have tons of rescues and it's not, it's not for slouchers. So there was a tryout for the team before I could even try out for pararescue. And th- I thought that was really cool because uh, they're filtering out people who they don't want to invest in, but also they're preparing you for some of the things you're going to face in the pipeline because when they kick you out the door to go jump in the pipeline, they want to ensure a high possibility of success in this candidate. Um, however, I'm sure I made them question their choices many times. <laughs> uh, my chief at the time, a guy named Skip Kula, he told me before I went, after I passed the, uh, the initial uh, screening, he was like, dude, you know, it's a hard pipeline. It's going to be a long pipeline. And it's not uncommon for people to fail courses, but my policy is you get three strikes and then you're out. So you can fail up to three times and then boot, Uh, which really kind of played into the whole thing for me because uh, when, (laughs) let me back up a little. So after I got selected and I trained with the Alaska team for a while, and because such so much time had elapsed between my Navy time and my joining the air force i had to go through air force basic training at 28 years old which was another like ego check humbling experience and it also was really good at just getting me used to sleep deprivation too because i just wasn't there wasn't time in the day to do the workouts i needed to do to keep my edge so while people were sleeping I was doing push-ups and sit-ups and pull-ups and jumping jacks and everything else I could possibly think of in the showers, on the floor, while people were doing night watch and stuff like that. And uh, it was kind of fun because there would be tough guys in my, my squadron like, yeah, I want to I wanna work out with you. It would only last one night. You know, there was nobody who was a repeat worker out buddy. <laughs> um, so then that rolled me right into the uh, – the INDOC, which is the selection course for the pipeline. And the INDOC is now a little bit different. Uh, I'm not fully up to speed on how they're running it now. They've gone through some changes since I uh, went through. And I, from my understanding, INDOC now is uh, not just PJs. I believe they've combined uh, combat controllers and maybe some of the other special weapons. I'm not sure, but I know combat controllers and PJs are back together again. And uh, but when I went through, it was just PJs. 
and it was run by PJs, and uh, they were some mean sons of bitches, and <laughs> they kicked our asses <laughs> constantly. And uh, your uh, interview with uh, uh, Wes Bryant, he does a real good job of kind of explaining some of this stuff, but uh, uh, and but my story is a little different, you know. Um, so. I'm in the pipeline and they model in dock after BUDS, the Navy SEAL training program. It's not exactly the same, but the intent is there. They're really trying to harden you and uh, take you past your own limitations and your own, like make you achieve your own potential, which is pretty badass. Uh, but at the same time, it weeds out a ridiculous amount of people. Like I, I'll come back to this, but it took me two passes to get through indoc, I failed the first time at midweek for pull-ups, which not a big surprise. I'm a, I'm a runner, not a rock climber. All my weights in my ass and quads. There's, I got little <laughs> chicken wings. <laughs> so that was a definite weakness that I had to work on. Um, and uh, so most of what goes on in indoc is a. Uh, the it's a place where people quit. So my my each of my classes started with over a hundred people per class. Uh, by the end of it, the graduating class was like eight people. Some wow. along those lines. Yeah, th there was classes where nobody graduated. They don't care. They're not trying to meet quotas or numbers because there's just enough people who want to try, and so they are not afraid to have classes with no grads. And it's wild to go look in the in the schoolhouse and they, every class has their class picture and there's classes where it's just nobody. And it's like, damn. So, um, yeah, there's no nice guys, no favors. I yeah. mean, my friend Roger Sparks, uh, who turned out later on to be, uh, my senior enlisted when I was deployed, he was, uh, awarded the silver star while in, in doc. And then they went back to kicking his ass. So for, <laughs> yeah, he was. I'm sorry. I should probably go in a little more detail. He was awarded the Silver Star for actions he had done well, as a Force Recon guy. Yeah. And so this is a Marine Force Recon guy, and the Air Force is like, You're still not good enough, bro. You got to go through indoc. Like everyone so, else. Yeah. Everyone else. And there's a lot of cross trainees. That's one neat thing about pararescue is there's a lot of cross trainees from other fields. Like uh, there's a, there's a, on my team in Alaska. There was a Navy SEAL. There was a bunch of Marines bunch of army guys it isn't just like a bunch of chair force dudes there's just a lot of people who <laughs> who know a good thing when they see it. <laughs> it was that strike one for you in doc it, yes oh, and all right yeah and so that was a tough call like that was a weird there's a lot of weird things happened in a short amount of time during that um so at that time uh there was another dude from alaska who got picked and was also an in doc with me and he was a crow a, a combat rescue officer which is the officer version of a pj and uh his name was major adrian and uh, he and i were in class together and but we'd also trained in alaska together alaska together for months and months and months we were really good buddies and so at midterms uh part way through uh in doc that's when i got set back i failed pull-ups and I was just like, okay, I'm going to take a couple days off, get my head back in the game, shake it off, let the legs recover because, you know, you're just beating your body to death. And, uh, you know, you're running, you're rucking, all the good stuff that anything that makes you sweat, they're going to throw at you. And, uh, but so I'm on this first day of leave and I get a call from my buddy, Chris, and he's like, dude, Jimmy, I'm sorry. And I th I'm thinking, oh, he's calling to like help me feel better about getting set back and to try to keep my spirits up. And I'm like, dude, I'm going to be fine. I'm just going to keep focused. And then it took a few minutes for us to realize we're talking about two different things. And I'm like, Chris, you seem very, very uh, apologetic. What's going on, dude? And he's like, oh, I guess you didn't hear about Major Adrian. Turned out on my first day of leave, uh, the team continued on with their training. And they got into the pool, and it was a hellacious pool session. And uh, Major Adrian wound up having uh, something happen to him, and he passed out underwater uh, and was never revived. It, so it, it gives you an idea how tough this course is. So yeah. there was a dude that died in the selection program 
And uh, yeah, that was pretty tough, but at the same time, it gave me a little more fuel. It's like, oh, okay, I'm going to add this to my pocket. I'm going to do this for Major Adrian, you know, yeah. because he was just a good dude. And uh, yeah, so then I had a little more hunger and a lot more pull-ups under my belt and got back into the next class afterwards for Indoc. And I had no problems. I, well, I, it was tough. It was incredibly challenging. To say I had no problems would be downplaying it. <laughs> yeah, there was a lot of times where it's like, I don't know about this. You know, there's, yeah, the pool is the great equalizer. And that's where most people tend to quit because you know, you're starting there day one. I'm this skinny little runner dude. And I'm looking around at these freaking like He-Man, He-Man dolls and G.I. Joe dolls. Like, mm -hmm. oh my God, there's no way. I mean, that guy's obviously going to be a PJ, not me. But no, those are the first guys who usually quit in the pool because those big muscles get hungry for oxygen and, and the oxygen isn't, isn't available underwater. Yeah. <laughs> That's where we spend a lot of time is underwater. And sometimes when you're thinking this, like, why would they be doing this to us? Why, what's, what's the intent of this abuse, you know? And a large part of it is to get people ready for the combat dive course, which is a real ball buster. But I also feel like later on down in my career in Afghanistan, some of those like harassments in the pool where you're completely oxygen deprived and you have to uh, conduct these uh, highly detailed tasks where attention to detail is critical in a time sensitive manner while you're under the stress of oxygen and getting beat up on by instructors. It really translated well into combat medicine when uh, things were just going sideways and like I'm hurting, you know, cause uh, uh, spoiler alert, I, you know, I caught a, caught around to the dome and, uh, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I kept going, you know, they, I, I sat off the helicopter for 24 hours and then I was right back on the helicopter yeah, crazy. and yeah, with stitches in my head, still dried blood on my face, still working on other people. I wanted to go home, but at the same time, what really drove me more was the mission the people who needed me and my own team and those times in the pool I think really helped kind of condition me for that because yeah. it wasn't a new feeling it was something oh, okay just put your head down stay focused on the task in front of you you can deal with that other stuff later and uh yeah with was Indoc harder than the combat dive school? Because the, the more I understand about that school I've always heard how difficult it is talking to Wes Brian about it you know like to just feel how hard it is reading your book is that harder than indoc it's different hard it's a different kind of hard um so i was uh i didn't go to the army dive course i was part of one of the first classes to go through the air force's combat dive school so the air force uh traditionally had been sending pjs and combat controllers to uh the army dive course down in uh the keys uh, but there just was only so many spots. There wasn't quite enough to meet the demand. So they stood up their own schoolhouse in Panama City, Florida. There's a Navy base there where they train the Navy EOD divers and stuff. And uh, <clears throat> so they stood up this class and I think I was part of the second class and the fourth class maybe. So yeah, another, another uh, washout opportunity. Um, <laughs> but that first time through dive school, uh, there were times where I thought this is way fucking harder than Indoc. Uh, there's no, I, I wouldn't say Indoc had any mercy, but their level of abuse was limited by the things they had at hand. When we got to dive school and they're throwing twin 80 dive tanks on your back and weight belts and they're taking away your shoes and you're walking around on beaches and stuff doing like <laughs> push-ups and, flutter kicks and stuff with tanks on your back in the sand and after you just swam three miles you know it was it wasn't very fun <laughs> but uh the second time around got a little better and i think that may have been because i had a little bit understanding of what i was getting into um but uh yeah so my dive school experience was uh was pretty cool at first i was really enjoying the ability to breathe underwater that was the, my favorite thing I loved about dive school. It's like, oh, air, underwater, yes! <laughs> After so much time of having air taken away and head shoved underwater, yeah. it was great to breathe again. 
And uh, it, this, this course is, uh, it, they call it crawl, walk, run, where they start you out with some basic stuff, then they amp it up and then they amp it up. But sometimes that curve of amping is, is like really, it's a real steep climb. And uh, uh, there's an event called One Man Comp uh, <clears throat> where your mask is blacked out and instructors are just really tossing you around and messing with you. And uh, there's all these things you've got to try to accomplish. Specifically, you're trying to maintain control of your air supply. And then when it gets ripped out of your mouth, it will. It gets tied into knots behind your back. And you're wearing a blacked out mask so you couldn't see anyway. So you're, you're trying to build a mental image in your mind of what this knot is. And you've got to untie it and get this air supply back. There's no cheating. You can't breathe off of your, your secondary or anything like that. And then there's all these, these steps you got to go through. Anyways, I did the whole procedure where you got to ditch your gear in a specific way. You do some things and then you put your gear back on in an exact specific way. And then you, you tread water at the surface and you give this I feel fine dive suit and then they inspect you. They're looking for twists on your straps, any of that kind of stuff. Oh, before I go any further, one thing about the pipeline is almost every day is a go no go day where you could be sent home if you fail. And that's like a stress that lingers over your head. Uh, so you know, I tell my, my friends and wife, like, yeah, I did this training program where every day I could get kicked out for three years. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. And so I felt really awesome. I was like, I nailed this. Cause I've been practicing. One of the things I learned in running was mental visualization, especially before races, I would spend the night or even every night before a big race and visualize the race, how I was going to feel on specific parts of the race and, tactics I would employ and I use that a lot through my pipeline experience you know okay how do I tie a square knot underwater without looking at it you know things like that and I'd done a lot of that with this ditch and dawn sequence and so I was like I fucking nailed it yes because this after this the course is supposed to get a little easier after you get past this one little bloop, one man comp and uh, I'm so stoked and I'm coming swimming to the edge of the pool they gave me the okay you can get out dude and uh so they don't call me dude um <laughs> yeah. i and i come to the edge of the pool and as i'm getting out i drop my fucking mask in the water and that's a safety violation and it's like settle out and having to sit on the edge of the pool going like what did i do wrong why did i do i was just so in the moment of excitement that climbing the ladder i dropped my mask and that small little lapse in of inattention ended that ride and uh, I had to go back to Alaska. That's one of the things that separates the guard guys from the active duty. When you get recycled from a school, active duty guys typically get sent back to uh, Lackland, where the cadre at the schoolhouse uh, enhance your training so that you're more prepared. <laughs> <laughs> and, but I went back up to Alaska, where unchecked full-blown PJs could have their way with me. And uh, that was... Uh, that was very motivational because I didn't want to get sent back home again. Yeah. And so I spent like three months back up in Alaska doing my best to train for dive school. And at the same time, what was really cool is there's new cones coming through. So uh, trainees in the Sorry, cones are people in the pipeline, right? That's the name for the, the unfortunate few who are in this pipeline. That is 100% correct. Yes. Yeah. Right. So the, the life sequence of a pararescue man is when you have these fantasies in your mind about being a PJ and you're training in secret, you're considered a toad. And then, <laughs> then once you pass that, that initial exam and you begin the pipeline, you graduate to a cone. Cones. And I still have nightmares about that term because <laughs> anytime a PJ walk around, cones, drop. And that, there you go. You're just doing a set of 50 push ups plus one for every PJ you see standing around and, one for teamwork and freedom and America. And next thing you know, you're doing 80 pushups in a set. <laughs> and if some person quits, you got to start all over. But uh, yeah, then you move into cone and then you become, once you get your beret, then you're a PJ. And then when you're a PJ, you're still kind of a new guy. They don't trust you with a lot for a while. Yeah. Really. In fact, uh, there was a brief while, and it was pretty common for new guys to have their berets taken away for a little while to re-earn it. Yeah, that, that's an ego check right there. Uh, but, you know, if you're not fully mission qualified initially, you know, it might, it might make you re-earn it just to, 
just to make sure you're on the level of them. Right. Uh, so yeah, back to dive school. Then I went back and uh, the second time I passed, there wasn't any major hiccups. There was a lot of fun, weird, wacky stories and stuff. Cause you know, we're in Panama city, Florida, and it happened to be during <laughs> spring break. And uh, <laughs> it was pretty cool, you know, and uh, surreal sometimes too, you know, you're doing these uh, crazy mock-up missions and stuff that are really tough and you're coming up out of the water and you see spring breakers on the beach having a good old time. You're like, I'm really questioning my life choices right now. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh man. So, yeah. So, Oh, you keep going. Sorry, Jimmy. Oh, I was just going to keep walking down the pipeline, but if you want to talk more about this, feel free. Well, I want to jump to airborne school. Um, oh, yeah. So like you're, your book is riddled with the pranks that you pull and the crazy <laughs> stuff that you do. And you did something at airborne school that I, I literally cannot even imagine myself even considering when I was there. And I think like anybody who's been to Benning has seen the jump towers, the 250 foot towers, like yeah. in the jump area, they're massive. You can see them from all over. I remember being hoisted up on that thing to be dropped and all the stuff that I've done, that is one of the scarier things, just like hanging there, not knowing when you're going to get dropped and still like having to put your faith in the army that you're not going to die when this thing drops you, you know, like <laughs> the wind is bad. Somebody didn't pack your shoot right, whatever. You free climb that thing, right? So like, yes, tell sir. me, tell me about this, man. Cause I, I can't even imagine doing that. So tell me like what, what was going on? What went through your head? How many strikes did you have at the time in the pipeline? Well, you know, um, so like all great ideas, this started with alcohol and a friend. <laughs> and uh, there's a lot of, this is a great idea. And none of this, should we risk analyze this? Nah. <laughs> and uh, so, yeah, I'm sitting at two strikes, one for in doc, one for dive school. And uh go through airborne and uh for anybody who's gone through airborne there it's like i kind of liken it to being a soccer goalie on a really awesome soccer team to where there's long periods of standing around being bored with brief moments of excitement and then back (laughs) to standing around being bored (laughs) and so in those long stretches of boredom you know there's ideas for shenanigans brew and uh my friend john and i it's we just finished. It was the last night jump. The next morning, we're going to go on the parade field and get our get pinned with our jump wings. And uh, my buddy John is like, dude, let's tag this place. And it started out as drawing green feet everywhere with the magic marker, grew into spray painting green feet with stencils on all these jump towers in weird spots so that when you're walking up those wooden steps, in some of those zip line things, you'd see like a green foot in a weird spot. You're like, ah, fuck the PJs. And then- Sorry, the green foot is a, is a marker for the PJs, right? Like correct, that's the... yeah. Yeah, okay. two green feet. Uh, and that came from Vietnam, uh, from the helicopters that were called Jolly Greens. And when they would land in the grassy fields and then take off, it would look like footprints from a giant. And so yeah. the Jolly Greens grew into green feet, which kind of symbolized the rescue community. And the PJs really adopted that. And it's not uncommon for like uh, the rescue pilot, or I'm sorry, rescue helicopter crews to also get the green feet tattoo after a rescue. Excuse me. Like including the flight engineers, the gunners and pilots and stuff. Cool. To earn it. Yeah. Um, so, but that's overall, that's kind of like the, the PJ gang sign, green feet. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so this grew into, oh, I got a great idea. Let's take a bed sheet and spray paint a big, huge green feet on this thing. And about this time, it's 11 o'clock at night, midnight, maybe one in the morning. The whole base is dark and asleep. And like, where can we hang this thing? And we both look up at this jump tower and like, oh yeah, let's do that. So we wound up uh, helping each other get up because the bottom part was chain linked off thinking like that would stop people from climbing these towers. And it didn't slow us down. And yeah, we free climbed these metal scaffolded towers. Uh, no ropes, kind of slightly buzzed, doing it in the middle of the night. So wind's oh blowing. God. And you could see cars down below looking you know, at their headlights. Like we'd freeze whenever a car come by thinking that maybe security got us. So we'd freeze and hang tight for a while. 
eventually, uh, my buddy John climbed all the way out at the end of the drop arm and draped the flag when we were like high five each other and we're like, yeah, this is awesome. And uh, climbed back down. We did it unscathed, no problems whatsoever. Wake up the next morning and at airborne school, wake up times around 4.30 in the morning, some ridiculous hour always. And so we're up and it's still dark and we're standing on, on the wires. And as the sun's coming up, we, we're, John and I are giggling to each other because you could see our flag from the jump tower from where we were. This white flag with big green feet flowing on it. And uh, all of a sudden we noticed that all the black cats, which are the airborne instructors that wear these black baseball caps and call them black hats. They all start like running around, talking to each other. You can see there's a major hubbub and like officers are coming and going, people. And then John and I do some quick math. I'm like, dude, I think we're the only fucking PJs here. I think we're the only cones. <laughs> there's no way that they're not going to believe it's us. But, you know, I, through our SEER training and stuff, it was just like, stay in your circle, deny, 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 <laughs> redirect. <laughs> and uh, so we're getting, what starts out is like a friendly uh, black hat, like, hey, guys, do you guys see that thing? That looks pretty cool. Do you guys know who did that? No, oh, no, that's crazy. We would never do anything like that. Fast forward hours later of us being on our faces and Cadre yelling at us, who fucking did it? And just doing push-ups. <laughs> We're in our blues doing push-ups as everybody else is getting pinned. We're still doing push-ups and John and I stayed in our circle. I don't know who did it. You know, we, no. And uh, eventually they pull us out of graduation. We miss graduation. We're sitting in the commandant's office and the commandant calls our schoolhouse and talks to the schoolhouse commandant, which is like calling dad. You don't yeah. want that guy, you know? And yep. he just goes, Jimmy, John, tell them what the fuck they need to hear so you can come home and I can deal with you here. I'm like, oh, I don't think I like the way this is going to go. <laughs> so we, t we kind of fessed up to it. And the, the airborne commandant was like, I'm really impressed with what your guy's physical ability is. That, that is just amazing. But I got a lot of knuckleheads on this base that are going to want to do the same thing. So I have to punish you. You can't do that. And so it was kind of bittersweet, but it felt pretty good. Right. Yep. Um, and became legendary, this big green I'm flag. Sure. And they had to get a special climbing crew that took hours for them to climb up the tower to remove it. And John and I had done this in like an hour with no equipment whatsoever. It is and so it's just, high. It's yeah. So high. God damn <laughs> The best part is they just threw the flag in the dumpster. And so John and I jumped in and, and no. saved it. Did yeah. you? <laughs> yep. And uh, as graduation pre present for the pipeline for John, I, I think gave it to him and he still got it. That's sweet, man. Yeah. God. And uh, you still got your uh, wings, right? Like you got your jump wings. Yes, sir. Yeah, I got, I was really happy about that because that, I was concerned they would fail us. Oh, my no. God. I couldn't believe they didn't fail you after hearing that. <laughs> <laughs> all right yeah. so uh i mean we, we haven't even touched on much of the pipeline but i also want to make sure we get to some of the the hairier moments of you doing the pararescue stuff um sure. I, I wonder could you take me to the first time that you even even maybe it's during your when you're in philly doing that apprentice work like the first time you're actually working on a real patient and you feel like this is for real now. Like I'm, I might still be in training, but this is the real thing. Like what was that first experience like for you going to the first call or, or could you set the stage for it? Was it Philly? Was it Alaska somewhere else? Uh, so yeah, it was Philly is where I did my paramedic rotations. Um, and that was like my first time working on uh, real patients that weren't classmates or DOD personnel. <laughs> and, yeah. uh, uh, I got uh, placed with a proctor who was really cool. His name was Larry. And it was down in it was Station 25, down in deep in Philly. And uh, also I did rotations in Camden, which is across the river from Philly. Both places, we, they sent us there because both those places at the time were some of the most violent places in America where we could get experience with trauma medicine, you know, like bullet shots and stab wounds and drug overdoses, things like that. And, uh, you know, I did a lot of runs initially that were kind of like 
vanilla-ish. Maybe I'll get an IV started or throw some O2 and taking, mostly taking van vitals and doing handoffs. <clears throat> but the first one where it was like, oh shit, this is for reals, uh, was when uh, walked in, uh, it was a call for an unresponsive person um, on like a third floor walk up. And these little tiny, narrow stairs, these really steep stairs are really, I've never been in buildings like this where they're uh, three, like a, like a single bedroom stacked three high kind of thing. And um, there was this really heavy woman who had fallen off of her bed and onto the floor and was unresponsive. And sitting onto the floor, I mean, it was less than a pillow's width between the bed and the floor. It was a really tiny space and she was huge and she was slippery and unresponsive. And so I'm trying to get her out and I keep slipping and I'm also trying to get vitals and starting to do CPR on her on the spot. And uh, eventually we get her down the stairs and that was like dripping with sweat. And it's like, we gotta move, we gotta move, we gotta move. And uh, uh, I intubated her in the ambulance and that was like my first real intubation with uh, a live patient, not like a training dummy or cadaver or anything like that. And it was, uh, it went in so easy, I thought I messed it up, you know, cause it's really easy to put the tube instead of in the lungs to accidentally put it in the stomach. And so I'm trying to check to make sure and my instructor is like, no dude, you nailed that, let's keep going. <laughs> and so, yeah, that was pretty, that was like the first time where I felt like these medical skills are like, I can do this and this is valuable. Yeah. And uh, I don't, I don't think she ever came back. Like I think she crossed over, but uh, it was a good experience for me to use my skills and like dealing in an emergency with a critically ill person. And uh, it, you get this adrenaline going on yeah. and all this stuff. And it's like really important to stay calm and collected and know your algorithms and do your checklists. And that's when I really also began to appreciate the way the military has been structuring all their training with these checklists and algorithms, because when you're in that heat of the moment, it almost becomes automatic. And you don't really have to think about, oh, this, then that, or, and, uh, excuse me, it just flowed really smoothly. And, and then when it was done and we're walking away from the hospital, I'm talking to my proctor, I almost didn't even remember what I did. It was so automatic. And he mm -hmm. was like, no, you just nailed that IV, you nailed the tube. And that was like a really good feeling. Yeah. And uh, yeah, so that was like the first time I worked on somebody and uh, in the civilian or who was, yeah, that I felt, that, I know I worked on a bunch of others, but that one really stands out in my mind. Because mm -hmm. that was also one of the first times where I was still working with a warm but dead body too, you know? Yeah. And that's something that kind of comes back in, in Afghanistan. You know, yeah. where the dudes are, are hurting or blown up or tore up and it's still warm. And it's like, you know, it's, it's, there's some mental stuff you kind of have to work through uh, because it does make you stop short sometimes. Like, whoa, <laughs> weird. Uh, but, uh, Did you come out of that, Jimmy, with like that first, that experience? Like, this is pretty cool. This is like... I'm, I'm on the right track. Like all this stuff that I've gone through is worth it now. Like this is what I should be doing. Yes. That just further reinforced my choices. It was like, I can now sort of save people's lives in addition to doing all this other cool stuff, like jumping out of airplanes and scuba diving, you know, yeah. and because this was really my goal was learning how to save lives. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, and it's something too, I still kind of carry on today. I'm not, I'm no longer active. Like I don't have active licenses as a paramedic or anything anymore, but it's a skill set I, I share with like my kid. I have a son who's in Cub Scouts or was in Cub Scouts. Now he's getting ready to be a Boy Scout. But uh, I, I tried many times to teach those kids basic first aid and stuff like that, because that basic stuff, it does most of the work. And if you get the, the basics down at an early age, you never know when that stuff might come in handy later on. And so that's one thing that I'm still passionate about. I don't, I know I'm jumping ahead. Um, I'm no longer active in the, like the medicine world or anything like that, but I am passionate about sharing that information and experience, hoping that other people can 
have these tools and if they need them, they know what to do instead of, because I can't imagine a worse feeling if like you see somebody go down and you just don't know what to do. Yeah. You know, that would be a, a terrible feeling. Well, <clears throat> moving from that, that, so that was kind of civilian world. Mm -hmm. you get your beret, you're in Alaska, as you described, the kind of, the, the unit you're in in Alaska is, is well known for having a lot of rescues just because of the nature of what people do in Alaska, right? Like the great outdoors, not a lot of connectivity. You're, you're kind of on standby going to help people out, whether it's skiing or climbing or boating or fishing, whatever it is. Um, what was the first experience you had in Alaska doing a rescue that you, or one that really comes back to you before getting to Afghanistan? Yeah. So <clears throat> one thing about uh, rescue missions, they don't advertise, excuse me, excuse, especially in Alaska is, uh, a lot of rescue missions involve, uh, window time, hours and hours of looking out the window for where these people are, because Alaska is so big. And the terrain is so diverse that it can be really challenging to locate people. And so you could spend up to 12 hours in an airplane looking for somebody. And I had a lot of those missions before I got one where my hands, where I got my hands on a person. And uh, the first one that really stands out was also one of my favorite rescues because this, it, it, was, it was just neat in weird ways, like unexpected. And uh, so it was, I was night alert. And so the PJ section up in Alaska for civilian rescues runs like a firehouse on 12 hour shifts. You have day crews and night crews. And that's largely driven by the airframes we're tied to because mm -hmm. uh, air crew have rest requirements and you can only be on duty flying for so long before they got to give you some rest. And so they're running two shifts a day. and I was, uh, you know, still really new PJ and I was on C-130 night crew. So that means we're going to get the long range missions, stuff like that. And any kind of potential jump missions, which is pretty exciting stuff. You feel super badass when you're jumping in to go save somebody. <laughs> oh yeah. <laughs> uh, but this was like a lady who was way like, I think it was a four hour flight in the C-130 way down in the Southeastern part of Alaska on an Island. And, uh, <clears throat> it was a hunting party. And uh, they had just arrived. Their plane had landed and they were, they had quads or four wheelers. And this lady had a, uh, a chainsaw and she had uh, strapped it to the front of her uh, four wheeler uh, to take it to their, their hunting site. And while she was going there, she had uh, her, her ATV rolled over. And since she wasn't wearing a helmet, the chainsaw just slayed her scalp right open you could see the bone you could see the white and it was real bloody um and it took us a little while to get to her and we couldn't land and there was nowhere for the c-130 to land and so then uh the guy i was with his call signs bear he we drop open he, he's a senior he's a senior guy by years on me and he's also loves shenanigans and he also liked to really kind of question my decision making and so he had the pilot drop open the ramp on the C-130. It's the middle of the night. It's winter time. The winds, you could just see the winds ripping across the wave tops because it was like mountain right to ocean. There was no flat spots. And he's like, Jimmy, what's your thoughts on jumping in? All right. Well, I guess we trained for it. Let's try it. You know? <laughs> I'll try anything. And he let me get my shoot on. And I was like, Jimmy, we're not going to jump in this. Are you kidding me? We're going to die. And so I jocked back down and like, oh, okay, well, I trust Bear. Uh, the helicopters finally got to the lady and uh, we found a place where we could land and we linked up with the helicopters and transferred on board the C-130. And uh, that's when I got to take over, uh, care for her. And it was really neat. She had this really beautiful pink camouflage. So it's like Victoria's Secret camouflage outfit. <laughs> and she was in great spirits too. I was, she's one of the most impressive people I've worked with because she had to be in incredible pain and yet she refused any meds and uh yeah she what? took it like a champ yeah and she was joking with us the whole time like do you think it's gonna mess up my part you know stuff like that i mean her skin was off of her yeah yeah like we put a wet gauze on her forehead to try to keep that stuff what? hydrated and you peel it off and it's like oh shit there's bone Boop. put it back on wow 
yeah and so i, I don't feel very strong compared to her <laughs> oh man yeah that's brutal yeah right. that was kind of a fun one though just because it was so lighthearted not lighthearted but it was a good happy ending you know? yeah and so uh, oh yeah go ahead keep going no no you you go ahead i, I want to talk more about this cook inlet scenario fiasco near death experience so this is sure. if i understand correctly this is prior to <laughs> afghanistan you're mm -hmm. you're a pj it's, it sounds like it's a night op and you're dropped mm -hmm. into this freezing area of alaska right yes so like what what were you doing there and what happened because things didn't seem to go as planned yes yeah, so um it's pretty standard in our unit that uh every other week or more currently you're going to do water work and that is to keep our skills up with working with helicopters climbing in and out of helicopters out of the water as well as parachuting into the water because there's water is such a huge part of alaska that uh, you have to be extremely proficient or you're going to be uh, in trouble and so <clears throat> we were this is a february before we were walking out the door to afghanistan in october and so every training thing we were doing was tactical we went from our cool bright orange rescue suits to the black tactical suits, took off all the active strobes and reflectors and put IR stuff on. And uh, the helicopter, we, so what the, the mission, the training mission was, was we're gonna do two helicopters. There was two PJs in each helicopter. First helicopter goes in, the PJs jump out, climb the rope ladder in. Next helicopter does the same thing. And it's about 40, to maybe a hundred miles, I don't know exactly, 40, 50, 60 miles away from Anchorage. You can't really see it. Anchorage is the biggest city in Alaska and it sits right on the water and it's kind of a beacon when you're flying you're like, oh, right, there's home. Um, but we're, so we're flying away from it and it's dark, it's February. Uh, I think the air temps were hovering around negative 20 and um, we're all ninjaed out, you know, and so, the first crew, the first, I'm on the second helicopter. Negative 20. Is that what you just yeah. said? Negative 20. All right. Yeah. 20 degrees below zero Fahrenheit <laughs> to be very specific. Okay. <laughs> and uh, a fog. So the first bird did the thing. The guys jumped out and it took them a lot longer to get back in the helicopter than we normally do. And, but we didn't really think about anything like that. Except Roger and I were like, all right, Jimmy, we're going to fucking nail this. We're not going to be as long. Everything's a competition. You know, that first team, it took them five minutes to get out. We're going to get out in less than five. <laughs> <laughs> and so I, I'm stoked. You know, there's a lot of faith in the equipment at this point, especially when you're jumping into icy waters. Like, it's not just negative 20 in the air. It's just at freezing level in the ocean. And the ocean is coalescing into ice chunks and stuff. The tide had started to change on us, bringing an ice flow in on top of us. And with the tide also came a fog bank, but we didn't see the fog bank because it was dark. And, uh, and so Raj and I jump in and uh, first thing I noticed when I hit the water was how cold it was. Like all the skin around my dive mask was just like burning cold. And even though I had neoprene gloves on, my hands instantly became useless. They were just big numb clubs and we realized immediately that we were not going to be able to climb the ladder out. So we gave the sign for uh, the hoist cable, please send down the hoist cable. And in all these operations, we wear climbing harnesses on top of all of our gear, just so we can quickly clip onto the hoist cable and get out of there. Well, something weird happened. Um, we had done water work a million times before and never had this issue. But this time when the flight engineer was dropping the hoist cable to us, yeah, I think it's called the above ground effect of the rotor wash, just which is like, which what I'm trying to say is the down wash from the propellers on the helicopter created this horizontal wind that was really powerful on the surface of the water. So the hoist cable would get about within a foot of my hand. I'd almost be able to reach up to it. And then it would just go zip sideways on me. And uh, the first time it did it, I thought it was funny. I was like, <laughs> Raj, look, look at it go. <laughs> he's like, and I start swimming for it and he grabs me. He's like, Jimmy, you'll never catch it. Just stay here. Let them get it to us. Cause it's their job to get it to us. And so like, okay. 
and we sit there and the helicopter's over top of us. And if you've ever been underneath a helicopter, it's pretty abusive. Yeah. And even on the best of days and in the warmest of water, that water turns into like needles smashing your face. And what we were doing, we were feeling like ice crystals sandblasting our faces. And uh, my mask was fully encased in ice. I couldn't see it. I couldn't see the helicopter. So I had to keep pulling my mask off to try to find things. But the rotor wash was so powerful that it was like, hurting my eyes. I couldn't see. It was just water, like, just squinting through and water flooding through my eyes. And uh, eventually Roger's like, fucking swim for it, Jimmy. You know, after 15 minutes of the hoist cable coming down and scooting away from us, it stopped getting funny. And uh, yeah. uh, we were both getting really cold. And then all of a sudden, uh, the, all the helicopter's lights turned on. And it was way closer. It was sitting right on top of us. And it was tail down, kind of flying backwards. And we were like, oh, fuck, that's not good at all. Helicopters don't like to do that. And uh, all these lights lit up. And it gained altitude and took off. And then it was just quiet. Just gone. It was gone. There was not a sound. Now you can just hear the sound of ice bumping into ice in the ocean, you know, and the wind. And then there's, oh, crap, there's fog coming in. And so Raj turned to me, and, you know, and I suspected at the time that it was a training question. He's like, Jimmy, what do we do now? But I also think maybe he was like, what the fuck do we do now? Yeah. Uh, and I'm like, I guess we start swimming. He was trying to swim for Anchorage. And he's like, good luck with that. And then we look around. <laughs> <laughs> and it's so crazy we were where we were was like about a mile from a collection of oil refinery offshore oil refinery thing and i'm thinking do you think we could make it to one of those it's like i don't know i guess we could try but it was we we only maybe tried swimming for five minutes but with all that equipment on and in those dry suits it's really 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 hard and around this time i'm getting deeply cold and Roger's not talking as much. And I turned to him and he's just like, I could see it in his face. He was, he was really, really cold. And I go, Rog, how you doing? He's like, Jimmy, I think I got a leak in my suit. I'm wet inside and I'm cold. And I'm like, oh no. And so I hooked, a, hooked an arm around his, uh, his harness to try to keep him close to me thinking, well, if nothing else, it'll be easier to find the two of us together instead of the two of us apart if because yeah. it started running down that checklist like oh there's the backup helicopter where to go and we had no comms with us there was uh and that's one of the things that sucks about water work is they haven't really made a great radio for water work i mean they have some waterproof ones but like when you're jumping in and out of stuff things get wacky and kind of jacked up and batteries go south on you and stuff so uh yeah we're floating there for a while and uh, nobody's coming to get us. And so I, uh, I had an IR um, chem light, so an infrared chem light tied to like four feet of shoelace type string. And that's uh, called like a buzz saw for those folks who don't know. Mm -hmm. if, and in fact, that's one piece of equipment I highly encourage everybody to throw in their survival gear if you're going off road, like if you're doing, going to the mountains, throw a buzz saw in there because from the air, you can see that thing from a long ways away. And it's, it doesn't take up any space and it might help you. And uh, especially at night. Yeah. So we used to use that for marking ground tar for getting eyes on the ground target or the uh, yeah. friendly forces to then figure out where to shoot. So, it, I mean, it's really helpful. Yeah. And it's such a simple thing. It doesn't require any wazoo technology yeah. and, and uh, not many things that can go wrong. And so I busted that out just to keep, just to have something to do, you know. That's how, one how long things. have you been in the water? Like, grand total. Before they finally pulled us out, we were in the water for over forty-five minutes. Holy and crap. yeah, and on the best of days, the suits we were wearing are thirty-minute suits. And so, yeah, <laughs> when the when the second bird finally did come and get us, um, they uh, they. Uh, they tried to drop the hoist cable to us, but both of our hands were just so useless that we couldn't even put a carabiner onto the hook. And uh, so I think Leo, one of my buddies, he jumped in and hooked us up to the hoist cable and got us out of the water. And so like the PJs happened to save PJs kind of thing. Yeah. But uh, uh, I uh, sat, like I bear hugged the, uh, 
the heating unit, the R2D2, I, I, for the whole flight home. I was like, I need you. <laughs> yeah, and I was I was in so much pain that I had no ear protection in, and I didn't even care. I didn't even ask for plugs or anything. I was just like, and those things are really loud. And so what had happened was, uh, from what we were able to debrief was that the helicopter that we were originally with, uh, the rotor wash uh, kicked up some sea spray and the spray came in the helicopter and iced up all their instruments. And then the helicopter gained a ton of weight and ice really quickly. Wow. And that's, uh, that's not good for those things. And uh, yeah, so they had to bail out to save themselves. Uh, yeah, but that was, a, there was some, there were some times there where I was like, I wonder if I'm going to be in the paper tomorrow or something yeah. like that. Do you have hypothermia coming out of that? Oh yeah, I'm sure. Um, I don't, we know, ne I never got rectally checked like my, <laughs> you know, <laughs> for the lavage, but I, I, I highly suspect I had hypothermia cause I didn't feel right for a week. And, uh, um, I mean, like I was saying too, I still have lingering effects. But we're so hardcore, the following week, week Roger's like, Jimmy, we're going to go complete that training we didn't complete last week. We don't want to go pumpkin on training. We got to check that box. And so it was like, and it's kind of funny because he and I had that same experience in Afghanistan where there was this crazy event and we're at a crossroads where I'm going to hang it up or get back on the horse. And I chose to get back on the horse. Yeah. You know? And Roger's a good, uh, good uh a good leader for that He's a, so let's let's just jump to afghanistan because I, I mean you were there for a brief period of time but you know look at save credited with saving i think 38 lives 28 assists air medal with valor purple heart so um and, and you do a great job in this book of setting up your mindset of going into combat like prior to this it was, you're watching it at home, you hear about it from other people, and then it's like real. And I, I can very clearly asso associate with that, that feeling that you have. And I think many people can from, from that experience. So the, the day that you're, you're getting your first nine line, like what's going through your mind? Because you've already done rescues in the civilian world. You've done them in, in real life, like literally in Alaska. How, how did combat feel any different to you in that time frame? And then take us through that first mission because it's incredible. Dude, uh, that transition to the combat zone was surreal. Um, flying into Afghanistan, crammed in a C-17 with a whole bunch of people. And like, I don't know what folks know. Like if, if you're a civilian who's never deployed and you're listening to this, it's not sexy how they get troops to the theater. <laughs> they cram as many bodies as they can. Like the seating on the C-17 would not, you couldn't do it in the civilian world. People would revolt. And they're crammed all this. And anyways, um, when we're coming into Bagram, uh, the flares on the back of the C-17 went off. And that was the first time I've been on an aircraft where the flares had gone off without me knowing where like somebody's testing it or hitting buttons and calling it out. And it made me really think, oh, geez, this is for reals. Like mm -hmm. people aren't playing here. <clears throat> and then uh, getting in the squadron, uh, it was... <laughs> At first, it felt like summer camp a little bit. You know, when it first landed, you're on Bagram. It's this huge, huge base. There's a bunch of GI Joes running around, and uh, everything's dusty and dirty. It's kind of like the movies, but not really. Um, it reminded me a lot of uh, the southwestern United States in some ways, just the arid, high-altitude mountains yeah. kind of stuff. And uh, walking around Bagram, and then, like, the first thing that struck me was just the weirdness of being deployed. So here we are, we're downrange, we're all tacticaled out, but when you're on base, you have to wear a reflective belt. And so it just felt so weird, you know? I was like, here we are in combat zone, here I am, look at me. <laughs> <laughs> and so there's silly little things like that. And uh, finally get taken to our little, our base, our little compound within a compound kind of deal. And we called it the opium den just because we wanted to have like this mystical, surreal feel for, for what we were doing. Because what we're, the work we're doing is this kind of weird, mystical thing. Like we come in out of nowhere, do these crazy things and disappear like the Cheshire yep. cat. And yeah. uh, um, 
so yeah, we embraced the Alice in Wonderland and uh, Opium Den kind of feel and uh, getting to meet all these guys. And the first time I got a nine line drop, so nine, if you don't know what a nine line is, a nine line is an order that comes over the airwaves and it can say a bunch of different things, but it's basically nine items on a list, hence this real creative name, nine line, that uh, uh, troops can tell what they need, whether it's food or boots or if they need backup or whatever. And most of the time for us, nine lines involve medical care. And uh, usually when it comes through for us, it'll have a uh, number of ca casualties and then how bad they are and then what we're getting into. But those nine lines are often incomplete and when you're flying in, they can change, you know, mm. and I'm sure you've had that experience as a pilot, especially sure. an Apache pilot, man. That's, that's what you flew, right? Apaches? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh, I got some questions for you too, after we can get to it. <laughs> All right. You got it. <laughs> um, it and, and Jimmy, you, I know you started in Bagram, but I, I think if I re recall correctly, you have at this point, when this nine line's coming in, aren't you in, in JBAD in that area? So yeah. Yeah, I guess I'm sorry. Yeah, let me be a little more clear. Yeah, so we fly into Bagram, and uh, that's like where our main cache of stuff is, and uh, kind of where we operate most of the time. But Roger, who I keep talking about, and our officer, Captain Kirby at the time, and Captain Bailey, those guys were phenomenal in pushing the leadership to expand our, our missions because for a while, the Air Force was just limiting us to only Air Force rescue assets because they wanted to make sure we were available if an aircraft went in. So that meant there was a lot of time we we're watching nine lines drop and medevacs going and getting it or dust stops going and getting it. And we're just sitting around picking our noses, you know? And so our leadership pushed and pushed and pushed. And eventually we got to be able to do the CSAR missions much more freely and we'd take on we were able to divide up mission alerts with those other assets like dust off could do this time period. And we'll do this time period because yeah. we were, we're good to go in bad weather and nighttime and all that kind of stuff. And we're also you, carrying you weapons. Go and, you guys could go in low illumination where sometimes dust offs could not. And that was a, yeah. like oftentimes I would see the air force get called in for some type of evac when an army chopper couldn't go in just because they didn't have the optics to do it. Yeah, and that's one thing I really liked, too, because it made us a little bit cooler. That's right, man. It was like, oh, <laughs> break glass. Nobody else can do it. Send these guys in. Yep. And uh, there was a few times. Oh, so getting to what you were alluding to, my first real uh, mission, 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 where I was. Uh, so we, after our leadership pushed to get included in some cooler stuff, they took a small group of us and forward deployed us to JBAD. Um, and uh, this other fob called Fob Joyce, so forward hopping base Joyce, which isn't very far from the Waterpur and Korngal Korn Valley area. And uh, the army had planned this operation called Bulldog Bite. And what their intent was to close down mountain passes for the bad guys through the winter time because they were ferrying troops and supplies over these mountain passes and we wanted to own that and shut them down. Intel came across as like, oh, this should be a breeze. There's not many bad guys here. Yep. We're just going to drop guys here, here, and here, and it'll be done in just a couple days. Um, things went sideways right away. As, so the first day of the mission, uh, I don't remember exactly what time it was, but it was daylight turning into dusk. And uh, we're flying in, and uh, uh, if the nine line came across as like, there's some dude, what, maybe. I'm a little shady on the details, which is why I wrote the book, because my memory is slippery. But there was people who were hurt who needed help. And so we flew in. And this stuff I clearly remember is I remember the, the beautiful alpine glow along the, the mountain ridges highlighting these stone huts. that they, These guys would build these stone huts way high up these mountains and these terraced gardens and stuff. And uh, we fly over the, the the Americans who need help. We have them pop smoke. We identify them. And at this time, uh, helicopters, you know, for safety's sake, we fly low and fast or really, really, really high. Uh, but since we're trying to rescue dudes, we're flying low and fast, fast. And we ran a racetrack over the top of them and we're doing our dog bone turns, coming around. And I can see them across the valley. At the same time, I see, like we had them pop purple smoke 
And at the same time, I see a dude in all black hop out of one of these stone huts. And I'm sitting on the left side of the helicopter, doors open, knees in the breeze. I, you know, I got my weapon in my lap and got, you know, I'm just kind of looking out, doing the cool helicopter dude thing, you know. And uh, I see this guy jump out and I see three muzzle flashes. And my mind's like, oh, we're taking fire. And I instinctively reach for my comms to identify the threat. And before I can do anything, I heard the, the sound of like, I, I, this is just the only example I can think of, but a sound of like a hefty bag full of really wet diapers hitting a wall at 100 miles an hour. It's like, Fuck. it was grossest sound. <laughs> and, <laughs> I, I, and like a whole lifetime of thoughts happened in like a fraction of a second. And it's like my medical knowledge kicked in. It's like, Jimmy, I think we just got hit in the forehead. And like the next thought is, oh, this is a horrible place to be injured. Like thinking of all the cognitive failures and things like the, my brain's going to be doomed. And then as I'm flying through the air, I'm like, this is like the only time where I really get deeply spiritual and look to the higher power. And it's like, you know, if I, hey God, if I live through this, uh, I want to be a better dad to my son. Because that was like the first thing that came into my head. How, how that, old was he, Jimmy, at the time? Let's see, two, maybe three. No, he was two, just two, yeah. little like two and a quarter. And at, by this point, I had already missed a Christmas and both birthdays, and yep. uh, a lot of important stuff. And uh, I was like, man, if I survive this, I don't want to miss anything else, you know. And uh, you had just uh, been shot in the head, also. Like, yeah, you're kind of describing this, but that's what happened, right? Like you, you took yep. a round in the head. Yeah, yeah. So just to help people understand a little better i was uh fully kitted up i had the bump helmet which is a sexy helmet and uh i got my plates on and everything and this dude who hopped out of the huts and fired three rounds at us the first round hit the uh the motor drive on the 50 cal on our helicopter that was on his side and uh, the third round hit our rear rotor drive and uh, the the axle of the rear rotor and then, but the second round went through the belly of the helicopter and through the fiberglass floor and then bounced up and went under my helmet through the scalp, not breaking the skull. So fucking lucky. And it just rode my skull all the way around to the, the side here and up in here. And uh, people will ask, well, doesn't the helicopter have armor? Well, yeah, sometimes, but we took that out so that we could take another person or two. We, we traded our safety for the capability of pulling more people out. And, uh, <laughs> which is funny because later on people started making PJ's chairs that had, uh, plates in them. <laughs> so, yeah. so you could sit on a plate. <laughs> yeah. Um, do they call that so the you, Jimmy plate? They should call it the Jimmy plate. They should. That'd be great. We could market that. That's right, man. <laughs> uh, so yeah, it, so I'm flying through the air. I'm tethered to the floor with a cow tail, which is a piece of rope carabiner to my harness. And, I sort of lose consciousness. I don't remember what happened or how long I was down. Uh, and I kind of wake up to my, my fellow PJ because we travel in pairs and I'm hanging out his side of the helicopter and reach over and he's like, holy shit, Jimmy's hit, Jimmy's hit. And then it's kind of turns into like this funny, it's sort of funny now because he did the right things, but I was being a combative patient. Uh, <laughs> the, hot, the hot bullet was still in my head. So my head was just screaming. And he sees his blood and he's trying to put direct pressure using gauze on this open wound on my head. And I keep hitting him off. Like, get off me, that hurts. Because he's pushing down on his bullet fragments and stuff. And so we wrestle with each other for a while. And uh, Al Brandon, he was, he was a hoot. Um, we, and he, so the helicopter, we, the thing that really bummed me out is we uh, couldn't rescue those guys. So we had to turn around and go drop me off because I got busted up. Long story short is I land at Fob Joyce and they x-ray my head, head is okay. I didn't break the skull, but they can't do anything else. So they're just gonna suture all that crap in place, just to close the wound. And um, the crazy thing is for years, I was pulling fiberglass threads out of my head and stuff. It had pulled so much junk into my head. I had never thought about things like that with bullet wounds. Um, uh, so they stitch, stitch me up. And I'm just kind of laying there on this bed with this headache. And about half hour, hour later, our replacement crew is bringing in those guys that we were trying to go pick up. 
and they are torched. They're really beat up. And there's not many beds in this little Ford operating base. I think it was like maybe three, maybe four. And so I jump off my bed, which isn't a bed. It's a litter on, on stilts <laughs> yeah, or sawhorses. And uh, I jump off my bed and I direct the, the, the med techs to put him on my bed. And I just start working on the guy. You know, while there's still blood and everything on my face. And I was like, okay, this guy's got shrapnel all over his back. I started lying on him, trying to seal up any bleeders and stuff. The doc walks in. He's like, what the fuck is going on? Dude, you should be laying down, man. I'm like, no, these people need it more than I do. And so I get, to, I, I kind of fib to our flight doc and I tell him, oh, I'm fine. No headaches, nothing. I'm great. Put me back on the bird because from the point I had been shot, it was just a nonstop rainfall of nine lines dropping in. This operation went sideways on the army guys. There turned out to be a lot more bad guys in that place. And the, and the army guys were just getting chewed up. And, <clears throat> excuse me. And this, uh, this battle elevated to the point where we had to call up other helicopters and additional rescue teams because our helicopters were taking so much battle damage that they were unflyable. And, uh, it was just nuts. And so I, you know, 24 hours later, you know, I'm kind of lie a little bit to the flight doc, but he understood too. He's like, this is our, I told him like, dude, this is our Super Bowl. This is what PJs train their whole lives for is this event right mm -hmm. here. This is what we're supposed to do. Uh, the glass is broken. This is an emergency. Put me in. And he's like, fine, do it. And I was like, but doc, I can't wear a helmet. It touches this spot. It hurts. I can't have anything. He's like, well, you've already been shot in the head. What could be worse? <laughs> so, so I just, I, I operated in that environment, like without a helmet for a while. And uh, that was nuts. Uh, so like my, that first mission back in the, uh, so this is kind of like with that water work with Raj, you know, getting back on that helicopter to do the water work again, that first time out, I felt nauseous. You know, I had second guessing and a lot of us doubt when I was in Afghanistan and I got back on this helicopter, I had those same kind of feelings, but much more acutely. And I wound up throwing up out the side of the helicopter, but I was just like, you know what? There's no turning around, bro. You, this yeah. is like one thing with life I found that the pipeline sort of brought out is that uh, the only, the fastest way through challenges is a direct path, you know, and trying to avoid the scary thing or, go around that challenge, it uh, was only going to draw out that pain a lot longer. And mm -hmm. so uh, I was like, I'm, we're doing this because the only way for me to get through this uncomfortable moment is to have a broken person in front of me to work on. And so we're flying in and we're doing two birds. And uh, normally the way we set our setup up without giving away too much classified information because we're so cool. <laughs> is that we'll have senior dudes who can call like a, an officer and a senior enlisted guy on one helicopter and then two junior dudes on the second helicopter and typically the two junior dudes will do most of the groundwork while the two senior dudes can have that tactical vision and uh but this nine line that we were flying into uh it just kept getting screwier and screwier. The voices were changing. Different people were coming on the radio. Call signs were being wrong. And uh, so they called Grinder, which is our fancy way of saying, we're going to switch places. And they, we dropped in the senior guys first. And it turned out to be Roger and Koa. And, uh, and both those dudes are amazing dudes. And that's one thing about this career field. There's a ton of amazing people. And I'm proud to be part of this community because of all these kind of people. And uh, so they get put on the ground and uh, as they're, they're not even on the ground yet, they're hoisting down and I'm orbiting, I'm in a helicopter that's orbiting, providing gunship cover. And as soon as they stepped off the helicopter, all hell broke loose. And it was better than any 4th of July works show I've ever seen. And I understood like, oh, this is what fireworks are supposed to be like, as you see in like Dishka tracer fire and, and RPGs and, it was unbelievable. The whole valley at night, Jimmy. Yes. Okay. And because you could see the tracer fire, and the, I could see that was one of the craziest things: seeing a real RPG fire off, and it flew like nothing I'd ever like. It, it didn't make sense. I couldn't 
I was like, what? That's how those things fly? Because I've never been on the receiving end, you know? And then seeing them light up our buddy's helicopter and uh, trying to return fire with my small man, M4. M4 feels like a badass gun when you're walking around the streets. You feel like a tough motherfucker. But when you're in a helicopter-based gunfight, it's just a pea shooter. It's yeah. just nothing. And so uh, you're doing my best to shoot from the helicopter, and we're all opening up. And, uh, you know, unfortunately, there's just not enough ammo on those things sometimes, and we went black on ammo. Uh, but <clears throat> let me back up a little. So what? at first, it was just kind of like a quiet mission insert, because like, when we went into that valley, the comms were funky. And we did the change, but it wasn't like there was, they had been, there hadn't been any active shooting in a while. So we thought we were cool. Uh, and I'm in my helicopter just kind of looking around and then I hear over the comms, I can hear Roger's voice. Uh, hey, uh, can you get us on the ground faster? We're taking direct fire. And I'm like, what the fuck? Really? And turn around and you just see this madness. And Roger, you should interview Roger because his story is, he's an amazing storyteller. And what happened between him and Koa on the ground is surreal like those guys need to be elevated um but from my perspective it was like we're trying to kill all the bad guys that are trying to kill us and we run out of ammo and we're up high in the sky we have no other choices we have to go away and uh one of the mantras through the whole pipeline is you never leave a buddy behind you know and so that was fortunately that decision wasn't mine that was like the aircraft commander's decision and uh, it was the right one because there's nothing we could have done. We just would have collected more lead, that's all. Mm -hmm. And so uh, we had to fly and uh, we can hear them talking a little bit and Roger's calling in close air support and getting some heavy duty firepower rain right on top of his head. I'm one valley over at a helicopter depot where the flight engineer is duct taping holes refilling the helicopter grabbing bullets and hosing blood out of the back of the helicopter we can just hear the boom ba boom boom ba boom boom where the boys are and it's just like heartbreaking i want to just run to them you know give me my stuff i'll just start running uh but uh that wouldn't have really worked out like i thought it would you know <laughs> you right. have those thoughts <laughs> uh and we get back on the bird and uh we're reloaded in record time we're back over there but the airspace is denied for a little while uh, because there's just so much going on. And so we had to loiter and just wait. And I can hear all this going on and it's just killing me. And uh, eventually we get to go back in and uh, get boots on the ground. And that was just like a whole Mickey Mouse affair uh, because our adrenaline was spiked. We knew there was tons of casualties. And so my, my partner and I are trying really hard to get ahead of the supply. Oh no. We're trying to resupply the ground guys with a speedball. Uh, <laughs> so a speedball isn't a bunch of cocaine or anything. It's a, it's a big, <laughs> huge body bag <laughs> filled with bullets and grenades and food and stuff like that. And uh, this fucking thing had to weigh 400 pounds. And I can't get it off our helicopter. We're hovering over the guys that need the bullets. And I'm kicking and I'm kicking and I'm kicking. We couldn't get it off the bird eventually. We get it off the bird, but we've drifted so far that it's like unusable for the ground forces. They couldn't get to it. It's like, ah, and this whole time is delaying us to get to Roger and Koa, which is what I really want to be doing. We get on the ground and it's dark and we get set right into like a bush that's on like a ledge. And so we fall off this ledge still attached to the hoist cable and the hoist cables tangled up in this stupid bush, the rotor wash and we're kind of half on half off this cliff. And we can hear the boys yelling. And this is like, oh my God, I'm trying. It's so hard. And finally, we get free. You know, the helicopter's over us. We get them to get out of here. We were even debating having them shear the cable, which is a big move. If they do that, they're no longer a rescue asset. That's kind of a bad thing. And fortunately, we were able to get off before things got bad because we really didn't want them because they're a sitting duck. Everybody knows yeah. where that helicopter is. And here we are, Mickey Mouse on the ground trying to <laughs> get free. Um, and that's one thing about this whole operation is the pilots need, the pilots and the air crews have brass balls. Like the helicopter pilots held their hovers as like tracer fire and RPG yeah. is hitting their helicopters flying through it. It's like, holy crap. And uh, 
So get up to Raj and he just has like carnage stacked all around him. Dudes missing faces and holes in heads and gurgling sounds. And the, he just points to me, he's like, hey, unfuck yourself. I'm like, who y'all, Sergeant? <laughs> <laughs> And I think he thought uh, maybe we were just taking our time to get up the mountain, but he didn't understand at the time we were tangled up yeah. in the bush. He's probably like, what are you guys doing? This isn't. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, he points me to this dude uh, who's uh, blue and uh, he's, uh, he's posturing his, uh, his body's rigid, not like, uh, uh, not rigid from death, but rigid from a seizure. And so, I get on this guy and I establish an airway or I try to establish an airway and I can't. It's just not enough time because the helicopter is coming right back on. He's the number one patient. Get out of there. Load. I, I clipped. Roger tells me to go with him. Oh, yeah. He's like, Jimmy, take this guy. And yeah, you hear like there's fire coming in while you're doing yeah. this. Like there's a gunfight going on. You got the hundred. You, I mean, you're supporting the 101st and Rangers in this. Op. Yeah. So it's not like just any old mission. I mean, there's a lot going on while this is happening, huh? Yeah, there's some legitimate pipe hitters on the ground. Yeah. And uh, yeah, they're swapping lead with friends, you know, and uh, or foes. And uh, <laughs> so I got this guy on the Stokes litter and I can't carry him to the spot. So I grabbed one of the guys, one of the army guys, who's just to me at the moment, it looked like he was just sitting down catching a rest. And I grabbed him like, hey, motherfucker, I need your help taking your buddy down here. And he gets up just out of like, okay, hoo ya. And uh, he immediately collapses. And I look down, I see he's like got a huge hole in his leg. And he's just not, I'm like, oh, I feel like such an asshole. And so work my way down, get the guy on the helicopter. I go up the helicopter with him. I'm working on him. And I'm trying to establish, I'm getting ready to get a crike. I'm going to cut down this guy's throat and establish an airway. And uh, I get bumped behind uh, as they bring in another litter. And uh, so I spin around real quick and they bring in this guy. They put him down behind me. I do a quick assessment and I lift his shirt up and his intestines spill over the floor of the helicopter. And uh, his story is that he got hit in the chest plate with an RPG and flung into a tree and he survived. And years later, I met this guy again. He's still alive. He has a colostomy bag, but he's still a jolly fella. And, uh, it was great because I'm in this helicopter and I'm trying to put his guts back in. And he's like, no, dude, work on my buddy. I'm like, no, well, I will, but I, this is a, <laughs> a mess. <laughs> he's like, no, he kept slapping my hands. No work on him. So I spin around and I do my medical work. And uh, eventually I get this guy breathing again. And, uh, you know, of course this flight's only 15 minutes long, but it feels like days. And uh, um, I get, get the guy breathing again. He doesn't, doesn't really start talking until we land. Uh, and that was like one of the best feelings because a lot of these missions, we pour our heart into people trying to save them. And then we hand them off to a higher level of care. And then we don't ever get any feedback. You know, yeah. we don't know how we did or how they did. Uh, this is one of those times where it's like, holy shit, he fucking lived. Yes. Yeah. Count I, it. I gotta say, man, Jimmy, as I was reading that, I would imagine for people like who would listen to this and think, I wonder what it's like being a PJ. In my mind, this was like you were doing what PJs were designed to do. You know, like you went on the ground, you're pulling two guys out of a firefight at night on a chopper. You have to crike somebody, like probably low light environment, tactical. Yeah, no light. I think you describe having like your setup on their chest as you're operating. Yeah. Um, like you're just all the adrenaline calming down, following the checklist. Like if there's ever a, a video of what it's like, this is probably the closest to it, I would imagine. And you're yeah. injured at the time yourself, like 24 hours from a head wound. You make it sound really cool, man. <laughs> yeah, that's what it sounds like, man. Like I would imagine yeah. if, you're, if you're 18 and you're like, what's this PJ thing? Like that's what you want to go do right there. Yeah. And you know, at the time it was just the right thing to do. You know, I yeah. was, uh, it wasn't like I was seeking glory or anything like that. Uh, I was just, this is my purpose in life. Mm -hmm. And kind of like how I talked about it, it was the Super Bowl, it's PJ Super Bowl. Yeah. This is, and uh, yeah, and it was awesome, man. But, and then that just kind of turns into a blurry week where we're flying in and out of that same area, contested every time for a week, just pulling dudes out 
<clears throat> yeah. And, and then Good you, <laughs> and I, I know I've taken a lot of your time, man. But I've, no, no, I, I like I could this. Talk to you forever, man. So you, you kind of talk about losing your memory or mm -hmm. some aspects of it from this head wound. Mm -hmm. I, I've never talked to somebody who's taken a, a round in the head. So just what did that, how did you start to notice that? Because it, it eventually had you medically retiring out of the service. Yeah, it was real wacky, man. Like it showed up insidiously um, because for that week, I was conducting purely trauma medicine and trauma medicine isn't rocket science. Um, and they pound it into our heads over and over and over for years, you know, so that it's, you don't even think. And I was operating from that operating system and uh, not really having to think about anything other than plugging holes and pumping in liquid. Yeah. When that, when that operation finally wound down, well, there was a time where I was returning fire and I forgot how to change my mag out. I remember looking at my weapon and just like, being confused, not, not sure what to do. And then one of my buddies reaches over and pushes the mag release button, which is for me. He like very gently reaches over, click, yeah. thanks dude. And, and then when we go back, we rotate, after all that operation, we rotated back to Bagram to kind of like rest and rebuild and recoup and get all of our supplies back up and uh, really take a serious inventory and debrief. And it was during that time that I started noticing like, some weird memory stuff, but there wasn't anything to put a finger on. Mostly what was going on was I had a killer migraine headache the whole time after that. It was just like the worst hangover times 10. Uh, and I was just taking handfuls of Motrin. It was like crawl candy. Yeah. And it's just not touching it. And uh, then later on, fast forward just a little bit more, you know, when I returned home the stateside, that's when the memory problems really manifested. Um, you know, and whether it's from the TBI or the PTSD or both working together, um, yeah. it was, it, there was times where like, I didn't recognize the lady I was married to. Uh, I was forgetting family members' names. I, when I started driving, I would forget how I got to where I was going, where I was going, how do I get back home? And this is before our cell phones had GPS on them and stuff. And, uh, and I was having really hard times managing life, you know, because uh, I didn't appreciate how much a uh, cognitive acuity is needed in daily life. And uh, I got really lucky because I got plugged into the TBI clinic down in Madigan, which is outside of uh, Tacoma, Washington, on the joint base, Lewis McCord. And uh, they have a great TBI clinic down there. And they really took care of me. But I never really fully recovered. There's long-term nerve damage to the exterior of my skull. I still get migraines from trigeminal nerve damage. And uh, I'm the only one that can touch my head. That's why I'm bald, because I can't have anybody else cut my hair. Oh, gosh. <laughs> and hats are a nightmare. I can't wear that kind of stuff for very long. And so uh, the Air Force said, thanks for your hard work. See you later. Uh, and they took really good care of me. You know, it took some time and some coaching, but I had a lot of awesome advocates that were in my corner to help make sure I didn't fall through the cracks because yeah. it uh, can easily happen. You know, I think anybody who's transitioned out of the military, even under the best of circumstances, realizes how hard it is to become a civilian. And, mm -hmm. you know, just reading some of the stuff, like there's a part in the book where you say, for once in my life, I knew I was doing what I was meant to do. And to then have that kind of like taken away from you and then have to assimilate into civilian life. Like, how did you manage the transition? Poorly at first. <laughs> you uh, nailed it. Because uh, th that, that one of the biggest things I uh, still sometimes uh, deal with is the loss of identity. Because yep. pararescue isn't a job. It's a lifestyle. And, uh, and it's not an easily obtainable one. It's you know, a very narrow, rigid path that walks steeply. That you can fall off any time. And so you have to work really hard and it's, uh, you know, having that taken away was really painful, you know, especially after such a high climatic combat experience. Yeah. Oh, let's wrap up combat real quick. Just cause you're right. I did not spend much time in theater. It feels weird because, you know, I talked to people who've been in combat zones for years, you know, cumulatively. Mm -hmm. I got shot two weeks in on my first deployment yeah. and 
I did finish it up, but it was only a hundred day deployment. And so that's pretty short. And so sometimes, you know, I feel a little inadequate compared to some of those guys who put their time in, but at the same time, it isn't about quantity. It's about quality, I guess. And I feel like I had a pretty high quality experience. Uh, but yeah, coming out of the military and losing that identity, but also losing the direct team, you know, the team that those group of guys uh, that were closer than brothers, you know, and uh, then just being kind of naked alone and afraid out in the wild, you know, in the civilian yeah. world where it's, it's maybe, you know, from the outside, the military world looks really scary. But I think once you're in it, it feels safe and stable because it's predictable. Sure. And then you get out in the w real world and it's, it's wild, man. It's it very is. unpredictable. And then on the other hand, there was an ego component too, where I had just done these epic things, feeling great about myself, but I'm here walking amongst civilians who don't care, don't want to know. And uh, it was like, what would what I do all this for? You know, what, what was the purpose? But then, you know, I've come to accept everything. It wasn't easy, man. I've had to have a lot of people help me through this. I didn't do it on my own. Um, I'm, I'm pretty strong, but I'm not that strong. Yeah. And uh, so, you know, and it cost me a marriage. And uh, there was even a brief while, which isn't so glamorous, but there was a brief while where I was homeless. Um, so being part of the guard, things aren't always automatic like they are in active duty side. And so when I rotated back, uh, it wasn't a seamless transition to medical care and all that stuff. So I sort of fell through the cracks because I was down here in Washington state, and my team's in Alaska. And so it was hard for them to keep visibility on me. And uh, also with guard, the pay system's kind of fucked up sometimes in that you got to submit paperwork for your pay. It's not automatic and it's month yeah. to month. And if the guy who's processing that paperwork's on vacation, your pay could be delayed for a month or two. Yep. And so I found myself in that position where I was like many months without pay. No, nope, my left, my wife and well, she, I'm not, yeah, we can pass over that. And uh, I was just living in a car in the parking lot on the commissary in the, in the commissary parking lot for like a week. And, uh, and then this uh, tact P chief was walking through and uh, I was wearing my uniform at the commissary, but I looked like a bag of shit because I've been living in my car. <laughs> and he saw all my stuff, you know, the PJ, the, the triple stack and all that. And he's like, what the fuck's up with you, man? What's going on? And I told him my story and uh, he made some calls and got me hooked up with some short-term housing and got me back on my feet. It was really cool. Yeah. That guy actually eventually became the uh, top enlisted for the state, which is pretty cool. A guy named Chief Tyvin. He's a very good dude. Dude, that's brutal. Yeah. So uh, like, do you do you talk to your in your mind with your son do mm -hmm. you kind of talk to him about these experiences do you in one day envision or hope that he would choose a similar path or maybe take something a little different that's funny we were having this conversation the other day <laughs> so my book um there's two versions there's the grown-up version and uh, it's the swear words and the, the dick jokes and then there's uh, the Scholastic Books version, which is really cleaned up and it's all PG-13. And so I forced my kid over the summer to read this book. He didn't want to read it because he, it, it's pretty intense. And there was a few times where he's like, I don't, I don't know my dad. Yeah. This is crazy. This is not the guy that I know. And, uh, but eventually he started asking really cool questions and stuff and like, hey, what's it like working out at night when everybody else is sleeping? And I'm like, oh, those are the things you do to keep your edge, man. Yep. And, but at the same time, I would be proud of him if he chose the path similar, but there's no way I'm going to force him or ask him to do it. Uh, I feel like I did it for him. You know, yeah. um, being one thing I realized through this whole experience is that sure, the warfighter has to carry a heavy, heavy, heavy load, but the family has a heavy, heavy load to carry too. Mm. And like my mom probably aged 10 years from that time span, you yeah. know, and it was pretty, and like, it took me like five, six years to kind of become Jimmy again. Yeah. And um, I, we had a family vacation reunion a couple of years ago for the first time since before I deployed. And my mom 
was oh, finally opened up and shared some stories about how she was really scared for me, you know, and it was sure. really, yeah, it was really hard because, uh, yeah, it's a heavy load for the family to carry, and I don't necessarily want to have to carry that. <laughs> yeah, it's a selfish reason. Yeah, yeah I'm like, why don't you be a coder or something? Be an yeah. artist. <laughs> what, one of the other guys I interviewed, another Apache pilot, I flew with JT Snow, and, and I hear what you just described, I hear all the time, that it's harder on the family. And so he had done, four, he was the biggest badass I knew as a pilot. Four deployments, like thousands of combat hours, and the hardest thing for him was watching his son go deploy afterwards you know like being that person at home don't want to watch the news and you don't know what's going to happen when you wake up so i, I hear it all the time um all right I, I got just two more questions for you one is sure is there anything that you carried with you into combat that had like sentimental value or superstition to keep you safe good luck charm something somebody gave you uh there's a couple things i consistently carried um I took uh, the normal, like a normal size American flag and I folded it into a square and I tucked it in my uh, plate carrier behind my ceramic plate. And uh, I did, I had two, one in the front and one in the back. And so there was two flags that went on every mission with me. That's cool. And, and I gave one to my, to my parents and I, I have one here in a shadow box. Awesome. And yeah. And then I had um, a small collection of pictures of my kid. And I kept them in my shoulder pocket with the hopes of if I ever got rolled up and they uh, start going through my stuff, it may humanize me a little, you know, yep. looking for that slight advantage. Um, although I got to be totally honest that when uh, those nine line drops, nothing else in the world entered my mind. I wasn't thinking about family or kids right. or anything. I, in order to stay alive, you have to stay focused on what's right in front of you. You can't be distracted. Um, mm -hmm. And then as far as like luck charms, uh, nothing really. I just, just kind of like my attitude, I guess. Yeah. You know? <laughs> that with, you, you mentioned earlier the Cheshire cat reference, like popping out of nowhere and then disappearing again. And I was wondering in the book why you chose that. That makes sense to me now as well. Um, very cool. All right. Let, last, last thing. And I asked this of everyone, but for, especially for you, Jimmy, going back, like all the hardship you went through, like leaving the Naval Academy, this long year, years long pipeline, um, what you had to see and deal with, getting shot, the PTSD, the TBI, um, and then being homeless. Like I didn't even know about that part, the family you lost. Like, would you go back and do all this again? Um, if you could go back to that 20 to 27 year old? Right. Uh, yes, I absolutely, without hesitation. And if anything, uh, my only regret is that I didn't try to be a PJ earlier. Like, I wish I would have maybe started out like five or 10 years earlier just to get more experiences. Because, you know, my pipeline experience was three years from 2005 to 2008. But my real brave wearing PJ time was just two years you know, until the end of the combat. And so I wish I got to be a PJ longer, if anything. Yeah. <laughs> so That's I have a question for you. Yeah. Uh, so right next door to us at Bagram was uh, where they parked the Apaches and the Kiowas and all that stuff. Um, and after Bulldog Bite, we started exploring alternative exfil options because of our birds getting chewed up. One of the things we've, we teamed up with the, the Apache guys is that they have these little things on the outside of their birds that we could clip into and ride on the outside. Have you ever done that? Has anybody ever ridden those? Because it looks yeah. like it would be rowdy. So usually like once, once a year, you would do a training exercise at your airfield where one pilot would clip in and you do a traffic pattern just so that you could feel what it was like being the person on the outside. Because it's freaky. It's not designed to do that, but... It can be done, and it's been done. And then in combat, people have done that earlier on in Iraq. They had they ferried troops from like across a river, basically, letting them hook on, pick them up, and drop them off. Just like field expediency, there wasn't time to wait for something else. I never had to do that in reality. I've just done the the, the training run, but for sure, uh, people have done that. That just seems like a wild ride. Yeah, man. I, I, it's not fun being on. I mean, it's fun, but that's not where you want to be. Right. <laughs> yeah. 
Thank, well, thanks so much, Jimmy, for sharing the story. Uh, the book is great. Never quit. Um, and I didn't realize there was a PG version because I definitely did not have the PG version. <laughs> it, yeah. I highly recommend the non-PG one as well. Uh, yeah, great talking to you. Thank you for being so open. Oh, I appreciate your time, Ryan. And uh, this is a really cool experience. I hope you enjoyed this combat story. If you want to tell your own story, go to combatstory.com. If you know someone we should interview, send me their info at ryan at combatstory.com. Hearing these stories can be tough or bring back your own memories. If you're battling PTSD, please call the Veteran Crisis Line at 1-800-273-8255. 273-8255. Stay safe.